First, the WCCOI team explores a new lead in the disappearance of an anchor woman from Iowa. And now authorities are exploring it too. The I team first got started on Jody Husentrude's story because of a connection between Mason City, Iowa, and a man behind bars in Minnesota. Investigative reporter Caroline Lowe has our report. May 1997, Cottage Grove, Invergrove Heights, St. Paul, and Woodbury. Four women terrorized in their own homes, bound with duct tape, repeatedly raped, threatened with death. Four attacks in 18 days. A rape spree rare even on a national scale. We're talking about a human predator, someone who stalks, someone who plans, someone who enjoys the terror, submission, and humiliation. Crime experts believe that whoever carried out these attacks has been violent toward women before. The WCCOI team has learned that the man charged with the four rapes lived in Mason City, Iowa, at the time Jody Husentrout disappeared. You are watching News Channel 3 Daybreak. The time is 6 o'clock. Time is working against police in the case of the missing anchor woman. Two and a half years later, the trail is cold. The investigation stalled. And that's what's so frustrating, you know? I mean, we, we pursued this with all our heart, and we still haven't been able to solve it. Jody Husentrout anchored the early morning news at the CBS station in Mason City. She never made it to work June 27, 1995. Police found her red sports car in the parking lot just outside her apartment building. Her personal belongings scattered on the pavement. Because most abductions involve people who know each other, authorities focused their investigation on Jody's friends and acquaintances. This stack of police files, just some of the clues collected about the crime. Lieutenant Ron Vandeweerd is now the head of investigations for Mason City Police. It's all part of a puzzle, and I'm hoping that one day that, that one piece will come in that kind of ties it all together. Back in Minnesota, police tied this man to last year's string of rapes. He's 24-year-old Tony Dewan Jackson. He's pleaded not guilty and is in jail awaiting trial. Police say he's a serial rapist who stalked his victims and carried a sophisticated rape kit with duct tape, handcuffs, rope, and a gun. How do you wake up one morning and suddenly become a serial rapist and perpetrate four crimes within 18 days? What else was going on? I, I would like to know more about this individual's background. There, there may be cases someplace else that nobody knows about. Vernon Geberth, a nationally known homicide expert, travels around the country teaching classes to police departments. He wrote the textbook, Practical Homicide Investigation. The I-team asked him to review the Minnesota rape cases. A person who engages in that type of conduct is certainly capable of killing. And <laughs> I looked at that one case and I was amazed that the gal survived. We also asked him to review the Jody Husentrude case and the information that we developed. The Mason City Authority should be looking at him quite closely. Geberth believes that Jody did not know her attacker. The scream is very significant. And was the victim of a sexual homicide. He says that since Tony Jackson is charged with being a serial rapist, he should automatically be investigated because he lived in Mason City when Jody was abducted. The stalking element alone would be enough to look. Just the stalking. There's no doubt these gals were stalked. He didn't just happen to bump into these folks. And there's no doubt that Judy Heisen Trout was stalked. So where was Tony Jackson on June 27th, between 4 and 5 in the morning, when Jody Husentrout left for work? We discovered he lived in a duplex just two blocks from the television station where Jody worked, and less than a mile from the apartment where Jody lived. This woman lived with Jackson that summer. We showed her photo to police, who noted a startling resemblance. That woman says she loved Jackson, but also feared him because he physically abused her. When he snapped, he snapped, and, um, and it, was, it was violent, very violent. I mean, it was a totally different person. It was like the devil stepped inside of him and just took over. His girlfriend moved out June 22nd in a stormy breakup. Jody vanished five days later. Investigators all agree that Jody's kidnapper used a vehicle in the crime. The I-team has obtained these documents showing Tony Jackson bought this car on Monday, June 26th the day before Jody disappeared. 
he didn't own it for very long. He returned it to the dealer a couple of weeks later, after the $7,000 check bounced. During the two weeks he owned the car, Jackson put about 550 miles on it, a lot of miles in a small town. The I-team also learned Jackson worked the evening shift at a local meatpacking plant. Monday, the night before the abduction, he left work two hours early, about 8.30 p.m. The I-team has learned that Jackson went to the emergency room for an x-ray and crutches. He told people he hurt his left leg on the stairs at work. The next day, he went to work for just one hour, from 4 to 5 in the afternoon. Remember, Jody disappeared that morning. The I-team wondered just how severe was Jackson's injury. Could his hurt leg and crutches be an alibi that might rule him out as a potential suspect? Because of privacy laws, we can't get his medical records. But we were able to verify he showed up for work on the 28th, the 29th, and 30th. And when the I-team checked his probation schedule, we found something unusual. Twice that week, Jackson on crutches went to visit his probation officer, even though he had no appointment. The probation office was right across the street from the police department. A buzz with media and investigators tracking down Iowa's highest profile missing person case. The television anchor woman known to all may have come to harm. Jackson was interested in the same profession as Jody. He talked of majoring in communication. And in the months before Jody disappeared, Jackson had a crack at show business. These college newspapers reported he hosted two live talk shows on campus and interviewed guests. The I-team wondered, did Jackson ever cross paths with the anchor woman? A friend of his recalls a brief conversation months after the abduction in which he claimed he had at a bar he used to frequent. What do you remember about what he told you about Tony? Um, just that he had uh, mentioned that he had seen her at the uh, Southbridge Lounge. The I-team has no evidence that Tony Jackson had anything to do with the Jody Hughes and True case. What might be clues might also be coincidences. The I-team located this vehicle, bought the day before Jody disappeared. Forensic experts tell us that if the vehicle was used in her abduction, it could still contain critical evidence. Now, two years is a long time, but you don't know unless you look. So nearly two weeks ago, the I-team took our investigation to Mason City Police. They'd already heard about Tony Jackson four months earlier from police in Minnesota who had wondered about a possible Hughes-Intrude connection. We thought that Jackson should be looked at as a possible suspect. Woodbury police sent Mason City a fat file about the Twin Cities rapes, a file that has been gathering yeah, this is, dust. Minnesota sent me a copy, and there, so that was really nice of them. Now, Mason City police tell us they did do some checking on Jackson after they received that file from Minnesota, but they found no connection with Jody Hughes and Troop. In the past couple of weeks since we interviewed them, they've been looking at Jackson a lot more closely. In fact, just on Friday, they met with investigators from the FBI and from the state to talk about their next steps. We understand one of those steps will be taken soon. We'll be comparing palm prints that Tony Jackson has back in Minnesota with an unidentified palm print found on Jody Hughes and Troop's car here in Mason City. Caroline, I'm wondering, have you been able to reach Tony Jackson about this? Yes, uh, Tony Jackson has called us collect several times from the Washington County Jail where he's being held on rape charges waiting to go on trial. He strongly denies any involvement in Jody Hughes and Truth's disappearance. In fact, he tells us he's never met her. The only time he's ever seen her, in fact, was watching her here on TV at Channel 3 in Mason City. All right, thank you, Caroline. Well, tomorrow the I-Team brings you the latest developments from Mason City and tells you how, for, the, for a brief time, Tony Jackson's future held as much promise as Jody Hughes and Truths. We'll have more from Mark a little later, but first, new developments tonight in a story that the WCCO I-Team broke just last night. Now, police in Mason City, Iowa, now say they will follow up on a possible lead in the case of a missing newswoman named Jody Husentrude. This new direction focuses on a man named Tony Dewan Jackson. He's already charged in four other rapes in Minnesota, and Dakota County Attorney James Backstrom, who's prosecuting one of those rape cases, told us tonight that three of the four victims look strikingly similar to who's in truth. Police still won't call Jackson a suspect, however. We will be trying to uh, establish any sort of connection between Mr. Jackson and Jody. Would you consider him a suspect now? In this case? No, I, I don't think I'd want to use that word. That's pretty, like I said, that's a pretty strong word. I team reporter Caroline Lowe has been working on this story and she's at the station where Who's in Truth worked. Caroline? 
Well, Amelia, Jody Hughes and Trude and Tony Jackson both arrived here in Mason City about four years ago. We don't know if they ever met, but we do know they both had a lot of talent. Jody was a rising young star at the news station here in town, and Tony, a young athlete who seemed to have a lot of promise in his future. Tony Jackson, number 55, a star on the court. His last game here, he had 25 points, 15 rebounds, and there were a number of scouts in the stands that night, so he, he could have written his own ticket. Coach Chad Brown recruited Jackson, who grew up on the toughest streets of Chicago. He got him a basketball scholarship to Waldorf College near Mason City, Iowa. He was the best athlete that we've probably ever had in our program, and a Division I caliber athlete at that. But Coach Brown says he kicked number 55 off the team halfway through the season because of violent behavior. We saw a kid with tremendous potential that looked like he needed a break. We had a soft spot in our hearts, and unfortunately, uh, we were burnt by that. That was four years ago. Today in Minnesota, Tony Dewan Jackson, charged with being a serial rapist, faces the possibility of life in prison. A WCCOI team investigation has found that Tony Jackson was living here in Mason City at the same time Jody Houston Trude disappeared. His duplex, two blocks from the TV station where she worked. Back then, there would have been no obvious reason for police to investigate Jackson for the abduction. He had no known history of sexual violence. But the I team has learned that four months ago, police in Woodbury, Minnesota contacted Mason City police urging them to consider Jackson as a possible suspect. I think that if the authorities in the Twin Cities area thought enough about this guy to send a package down to Mason City, I would expect that Mason City should have reacted quite rapidly. This is a package Woodbury sent down, a fat file about the Twin Cities yes. rapes, a file police dusted off two weeks ago when we asked to see it. An I-team investigation found Tony Jackson bought a car the day before Jody disappeared and only owned it for two weeks but put on about 550 miles on it. The I-team located the car, and because experts tell us it might still contain forensic evidence, we told authorities about the vehicle. We looked at the timeline the night before the next day. That was two weeks ago. Police still haven't taken the car to a forensic lab. Oh, what can I tell you? <laughs> Shame on them. Vernon Gebberth is a national oh, homicide expert. He wrote the textbook, Practical it's Homicide it's Investigation. The I team asked him to review the information we developed. But first thing, you, you'd go take a look at that car. Absolutely, because that's physical evidence. The woman who owns the car says she'll cooperate and let police take it without a search warrant. A couple of days ago, police called and told her they want to, but they still haven't picked it up. Kind of strange, um, kind of exciting to know if, if it is connection with her. Hopefully we'll all know. Tony Jackson called the I-team from jail. He told us, quote, I can't even elaborate on Jody. I don't know nothing about her. The only thing I know about her is she came up missing, and that was it. Even if Jackson knows more than he is saying, solving such a cold case is very much a long shot, particularly without a body. It's almost impossible. It's almost impossible. It's almost eerie. Tony Jackson has been on the air at Jody's TV station before. This video came from their tape library. Tonight, they'll be showing his tape again, this time as part of their lead story. Tony Jackson called the I-team last night after a report. He sounded relaxed but told us, quote, he thought the report was really reaching and once again he's declining to answer specific questions about the abduction of Do Jody Husentrude but insisted he had nothing to do with her disappearance. Caroline, how are the folks in Mason City reacting to this? It's the talk of the town. I mean, it said the posters have faded, the yellow ribbons have gone down, but everywhere you go today, people are talking about it. They hope that this is a break they need, but they're kind of cautiously sitting by waiting to see what's next and, next and just hope it gets a thorough investigation. Okay, Caroline. And Caroline and the I-team will stay on the story in Mason City and will follow up tomorrow as the investigation progresses. Tonight, I'm at the Mason City Police Department. Earlier this evening, investigators seized a car they want to examine, looking for any possible links to the abduction of Jody Husentrude. The I-team discovered that Tony Jackson bought this car on June 26, 1995, the day before Jody disappeared. He only owned the car for two weeks. 
Now it belongs to this woman who drove it to work today. She's been anxious for authorities to take the car. The I team told them about the vehicle two weeks ago. How's it feel to be driving around with such a crucial piece of evidence potentially? I don't know how to describe it. It gives you willies, I guess. You know, it feels very weird. Tomorrow, police will take the car to the state crime lab in Des Moines to look for potential forensic evidence. Evidence is so minute now, uh, we may looking, be looking for a hair strand. After weeks, days, months go by, that hair strand can be removed just by someone getting in and out of that vehicle. Therefore, uh, we feel it's very critical to receive that vehicle as soon as possible. John Lang works at the Iowa Department of Criminal Investigation. He called the Tony Jackson lead a strong one. He says an agent will go to Minnesota to try to ask Jackson if he has an alibi. We're going to attempt to contact him uh, to in further investigation by seeing if he'll cooperate with us. We don't know that he will, but we don't know that he won't. We have already spoken several times with Tony Jackson, and he's always strongly denied any involvement in the abduction of Jody Husentrude.